Get Mr. Asarata's take on his reason zero season three episode five Capella's definition of love. What is Capella's definition of love? Based on the way she was talking about how oh you know you want to tell that you love Amelia because she's got a nice heart that like you know that she was there for you and all this sentimental emotional stuff that's underneath the skin. No, you only care about the lustful shit, the way that she looks, her hair. Her face, her titties, and every stuff like that. Capella's definition of love is probably so twisted that it only pertains to these very hypersexualized outward appearances rather than what's inside. This week's episode was Capella's standouts, and we finally get a good look at what her authority actually entails. We start our first little fight here against Gluttony, and how things aren't looking so good for Krush. We also get my least favorite decision of the season so far, and if you're an anime only, you're gonna want to hear about this, so stay tuned. All right. To open, we pick up our last week's post credit scene left off. As Regulus says, trust me, you being a virgin is crucial. And he's not like the other guys. Amelia's- He really isn't like the other guys, though. There's never been someone like Regulus so far we met in ReZero. And he's still a virgin on top of that. He'll remain a virgin because he has no intention on defiling himself nor Amelia. It's all about the purity. I think Regulus is, you know, very unique. Like the other guys. Amelia's lack of understanding of the word virgin practically makes him start glowing, calling mm -hmm. her truly the manifestation of his ideal maiden. And now every time he says something cringe like this, I can't help- Imagine Regulus goes out and uh, to some like uncharted island and finds people that's never contacted civilization. And they're also very, very beautiful like Amelia. That's what Regulus wants. Completely ignorant people who are unaware of the things that society would deem you you know, corrupt or like, like, like being like, like even like being completely nude and not understanding that there is some sort of shame attached to that because that's like what society labels you. Regulus is all about that. He's just like all about purity. The more ignorant and less aware you are of these things like being a virgin and stuff like that, that is exactly up his alley. Help but think of the foil of Subaru I mentioned in the episode three video. He invites in wife 184 to get her dressed and prepared for the ceremony, and I could finally answer a question I kept getting in the comments. She's the one that unstripped Amelia, or stripped Amelia, because Regulus would never do that. He can't defile his hands. How does he still only have 79 wives after all these years? He doesn't, though. 79 is a slot safe for Fortuna back in the day, but it has now been fulfilled by Amelia. He has hundreds and hundreds of wives. But some, many of them are dead. Doesn't mean that he has 79 wives at the moment. Well, the answer is, he doesn't. He just left the 79th spot open. Yep. So he actually has nearly 200 wives that we know of so far. Amelia calls him a wicked king. And after a moment of silence, 184 mutters something in agreement. So they got the title of the Little King. The Little King and Regulus constellation matches, right? I spoke about what the name Regulus means at length in the episode 3 video, and it really came full circle here. To those that don't feel like going back, Regulus is a star in the constellation of Leo, who, which mm -hmm. represents Leo the Lion. A lion would take women as hostages to its lair in a cave, and was impervious to any weaponry. A pretty fitting meaning, especially since Regulus can also mean Little King. And we now know that Regulus didn't just come alone, but he also brought at least some of his wives. After we check up- 184, I guess, is the most, uh, I guess she's like, employee of the year, huh? And I wonder how long she's kept 184. I bet they're all, like, Regulus existed like hundreds of years ago before, right? Or at least back, as far as back as when Fortuna was around. 184 probably is a regular human, but she probably is like rank one wife in terms of like loyalty and servitude. And that's why Regulus feels comfortable ordering her around as like the number one girl to do shit. Up on Amelia, things immediately hit the fan over at City Hall. As Subaru unleashes his most powerful blow against Roy, and at the same time, Cruz attempts to open up, but all the attacks are meaningless against his dodging capabilities. Yep. Julius leaps in to help even the odds, and they refer to each other by code names, keeping in mind Al's advice from last episode. Ju but I wonder if that advice would matter with this person, because again, this is not Lai, this is Roy. Lai Baten Kaito's white whale. Powers are similar, erasing shit. Roy Alford Hydra, most likely Black Serpent, is the powers the same. And maybe. You know, Roy could then memorize the names and give it to Lai if we're going to think that they have different powers and then maybe Lai could use that to do something with it. Who knows? Julius tells Subaru to focus on the goal and Subaru arrives at a crossroads that displays his growth so far. He can either succumb to his desire for revenge and his own selfish want to see Rem again, which I don't think anyone would fault him for picking, 
or he can prioritize the overall safety of Pristella and go after Lust to stop her from using the Meteor. So yeah, I think this is a great moment for Subaru too, as we see more development and maturity. Cruz caught the hero's cut, which is sad considering how this fight's about to go. Gone is the Subaru of old who would lash out at Gluttony and not listen to the advice of others, as he rushes into City Hall. This is a cool scene. Funny, cute, because Cruz is screaming like a dainty little girl, but cool because Subaru is just like... I don't know, the way that he was moving around the rooftop with this whip, the mobility was cool. Cruz engages in battle with a black dragon known as Capella, while Subaru gets a cool moment of sliding under to save a hostage. The dragon faces an unbelievable defeat at the hands of Krush. Yeah, unbelievable. It was too easy. The dragon didn't even attack Krush. The dragon also has the same eye color as Garfield's stepdad. The dragon also kind of saved, you know, Subaru and Krush at the end. There's also supposed to be stepdad, you know, in the tower, but he's not present anymore. We also know that, you know, Capella can turn humans into different beasts and monsters, right? So this probably is Garfield's stepdad. Its wings ripped, fangs broken, and scales shorn, and as it collapses on the spot, allowing Subaru to head to the rest of the hostages. There's only one thing that unsettles him. There's no sound coming from the door. Opening it, something unforgivable lies beyond. Insects. There were countless gazes. Maybe they weren't even looking. The room was jammed full of human-sized flies, all of them transformed. Ew. Then, the unthinkable happens. Krush is ambushed by Capella, and the girl laughs at Subaru. There is a cut here from Capella's talk with Subaru that I find quite sad. Oh. Subaru whips a piece of rubble, trying to use some rocks to hit her. The narration in this part is particularly good, noting how even in anger, the current Subaru knows that he can't fight an archbishop, and is just trying to escape with Krush. Capella lets it hit her, and yep. continues to mock and berate him, blowing Subaru away and calling him irrational. He slowly gets brutalized. Yeah, she called us irrational. Well, we asked, are you, the dra are you actually a dragon that can turn into this humanoid form that I see in front of me? Because Subaru saw the dragon tail, and Capella said, that irrationality is why you're a fucking moron. She continually transforms in front of him, and his mind finally makes the mental link. Who was to say that it could be used on just her, as he thinks of all the flies in the room adjacent? This is yet another reminder for Subaru. Sin archbishops are existences of pure evil, mm -hmm. and the gap between him and one can never be filled. And like, the logic as well that they display, of saying, we could you possibly love, like Amelia, if you turn into a fly? What a stupid argument to be made, but it's supposed to be stupid. Every one of them is supposed to have very stupid, extreme, twisted logic based on the sins they represent. So, of course, like, yeah, of course Amelia turned into someone that she doesn't even represent anymore. Her soul, her body, everything has changed about her. It's not even Amelia anymore. You just changed her to a completely disgusting separate object. How the fuck are we supposed to love it if we're not supposed to? But if, you know, there was some semblance of Amelia that I knew still there was there, I bet that I could still love, and maybe it'd be easier if I was also changed into a similar being. Capella informs us that the reason she changed the people in the city is so that they cannot be loved, or even looked at. People are creatures who can't live without loving someone. Since they are creatures who can't love something that is strange or revolting, then by process of elimination, they can't live without loving something they can love. Subaru feels immense discomfort because she loves him. Not just him, but Krush, Julius, Garfield, Wilhelm, Ricardo. She loves them all. Among her rant, about being a compassionate woman, Capella's rant made me think of one thing. Capella mm. is showing a more extreme version of what Amelia had made Subaru face in episode 13. The me that exists in your head must be great, she said. The idealized Capella's version. Here is a direct reference to that because all of the Sin Archbishops reflect Subaru in some way. Petal Juice's entitlements, Regulus's controlling attitude, Sirius's infatuation, and Capella's ideal form. She shows this further by in the rant boiling down relationships to sexual interest and criticizing Subaru and humanity at large for dressing up lust as love. It's a strong reading for the character that can shapeshift to be whatever you want, but still can't hide her repulsive personality. Yeah, I think that whole Capella representing Subaru's idealistical thing, is that a reach? Not really. I don't think it's really fair to say that all the sins only represent Subaru. I think everyone are riddled with sins, right? You don't have to be the embodiment of every single sin, but Seven Deadly Sins resides in every one of us, and since Subaru is the main character and the driving force that we see from the perspective, it does make sense how Capella finally is like, a cold quote, like um, a callback to that episode 13 C, the idealized version of Melia. Regarding dressing up lust for love, definitely there is some partial truths of how Subaru was infatuated with Melia based on her looks only, right? But lust is not love, right? You can't really love someone if you don't even know what they're truly all about. You only see the outward appearances and then, you know, you, you're kind of like, 
engaged and then you get to know more about them then that's when love actually forms capella again there's like partial truth in what she's saying but the logic that she displays is extremely twisted and it seems compelling until you realize that exact the example that she gave of saying like if amelia turned into like let's say a fly could you still love because it's a revolting form that fundamentally makes no fucking sense because you have changed her into a being that's not even her and her soul also probably is not the same either. Of course we can't fucking love something based on the outward appearance of something that doesn't even resemble what we first fell in love with. You're comparing a completely separate thing. It's a strong reading for the character that can shapeshift to be whatever you want, but still can't hide her repulsive personality. She sinks her teeth into Subaru's leg, causing it to fully fly off this time. As she pours pitch black ichor into his leg and it hurts. He felt fear that originated from a different dimension, as his blood and her blood mixed. But before things could progress, the dragon blew flames into the room. Garfield's stepdad saved us here. The dragon blood. Capella said that her blood has dragon traces blood in it, and it's also cursed. Cursed or the dragon blood or some shit. It's supposed to like mutate us. If we what, what does she specifically say? Something about like if we succumb to it, then we should be able to transform. But the fact that we did not transform, what does that mean? It means that we overcame it and we're now just good, but with dormant dragon blood in us? Does that go away? Are we cursed? I don't know. Capella is doing a great job at being one of the two main standouts of the season so far. Her and Sirius doing really well at making you feel locked in. Not only are they both getting some good expressive character animation, they are both very powerful on-screen presences that demand mm -hmm. your full attention. Especially with the sheer cruelty that Capella displayed this week. Absolutely crazy shit. We cut to Anastasia and Kiritaka, who are receiving word that the battle at City Hall is underway. However, there's a pretty big vibe shift as Kiritaka informs Anastasia that every member of the Council of Ten has wah, been found wah. dead. Except for him, of course. They're dead? I thought that they were caught. Were they confirmed to be dead? Every member of the Council of Ten has been found dead. Oh, except shit. Except for him, of course. But why would that be? Yeah, why would they kill people that has information on where T-Phone's remains could be? I thought the whole point of trying to prioritize the securement of the Pristilla 10 is to not get that information out. Maybe they all died while being interrogated and the person doing interrogation was a little bit too cruel and harsh and, I don't know, just killed them off if we're getting the information. Maybe they got the information and they killed them off afterwards. Who knows? If they are looking for the witch's remains, wouldn't they be crucial to discovering them? If they deduce the next target would be Kiritaka, and at the same time, a shockwave shoots through the building as Sirius appears. Hetero and Tivi, with the help of Ferris, mobilize to protect their lady. Anastasia asks them to buy two minutes, mm. as they both escape to the White Dragon Scales. We cut to the continuation of Reinhardt, Heinkel, and Felt, who are still at a standstill until Otto causes enough chaos for Reinhardt to capitalize on Anime only scene. and hold his father back, who was then promptly instantly knocked out by Felt. Reinhardt, after a few episodes, is finally unleashed upon Pristella, but just how much can he really tip the scales in a situation? Nah, he's not gonna do shit. I guarantee you Reinhardt is not gonna do something so significant that the day will be saved. There's no way. They're gonna figure out a way to remove him from the fucking equation. They're gonna figure out a way to nerf him. And even if he does something, it'll be just like one specific thing, and there's still gonna be way more problems. It doesn't make sense for the most powerful character to solve everything, but it's also very frustrating that Tape continues to quote-unquote nerf very OP characters like Reinhardt and try to figure out situations to remove him. ...situation like this. We see how the fights at City Hall are going, as they can't help but watch the dragon obliterate City Hall. Wilhelm warns the party to get to high ground as something approaches, and everyone is swallowed up by walls of water taller than most of the surrounding buildings. Garf barely clings on, but he can't find anyone, until he watches Subaru get thrown out of the building, and tries to reach him, getting swallowed up by the water. So I wonder where Cruz is going right now with the dragon. Who knows? But Subaru falls off. Now he's drowning. And I don't feel like he's gonna die here in loop because so many other plot points were moving ahead. Especially with the Reinhardt finally free. You know, um, Capella also making extra demands regarding Betty and the quote-unquote Tomb of Wisdom. We get a post credit scene of Amelia watching over the flooded city in horror as the scale of the damage is unbelievable. As Capella's final broadcast begins, we learn more of the Witch Cult's demands, the Book of Knowledge, the donation of an artificial spirit, and the wedding of a silver-haired maiden, paired with Typhon's remains, of course. No, what do demands really mean? The Book of Knowledge and the donation of the artificial spirit. 
most likely Bieko, and they don't really know that Bieko's grimoire has been burnt in the hidden library last season. But their gospel, which they're getting instructions from, are probably telling them that. Particular. Let me know. In total, this episode was pretty good. ReZero did what it does best and nailed the absolute brutality of Capella versus Subaru, if you can really even call it a fight. And now, Reinhardt is in play. And where do you guys think he's gonna go first? I don't know. Just I, I just I'm not gonna bet anything on Reinhardt because the more that I have faith and hope in him, the more that I'm gonna be disappointed when Tapi inevitably removes him from the equation and makes us figure it out for ourselves. So I was gonna have a break time section in every episode video, assuming they were important enough, but they weren't. Thankfully, that's what I prefer. I like break time being a place for silly little things to happen. However, that stopped entirely this week. Now, if you're watching this, there is a non-zero chance you have no fucking idea what break time even is. If you do or don't, please comment down below because I am very curious how many people actually know this exists. Do you think that the average person watching ReZero will be watching a video from Asaratha about cut content stuff? I don't think so. And the reason I ask this is because I think the average person doesn't even know what break time is and therefore they're not even watching this video to even be aware of that. You know what I mean? This is traveling into cut content territory, but now that it's in break time, it's technically not cut. Proceed with caution if you really wish to. I spoke a couple of videos ago about how Aldebaran being isekai was cut from the anime. Well, they took the least creative, least interesting, and worst execution of all of them to re-add it, by putting it in break time. I absolutely hate this because, as mentioned before, most people don't watch break times. They only get around 200,000 views on YouTube, and they are all yeah. unsubbed, not officially available to most, and people don't know they exist. It's very inaccessible, and yeah, people don't even know it exists. I still, like, to me, I had a hard time understanding why people would be so fucking upset about the secret being exposed. But of course, I am not the average consumer, and I already knew about this stuff because I'm seeking out extra cut content. I thought the break time out doing this was pretty cool, but then I realized that for the anime only, is what are they gonna think, right? What the fuck are they going to think when more future developments between Al and Subaru happens with the assumption that they already know that they're both Isekai characters and then the, uh, the audience watching it will be like, what the fuck? What's happening right now, right? They wouldn't make the connection unless they watch a break time. I still feel like we should wait for Studio White Fox to maybe have their own anime only uh, rendition of Al's bombshell being revealed in those canon episodes. But until that happens, I have faith. We, um, learn that Al has been waiting for Subaru to notice about his status as a fellow struggler of fate. Exchanging a little saying that only people from Japan know, as Al reveals that he has been here for 19 years. Mm -hmm. And Al has never met anyone else like him or Subaru. And he tells Beatrice to do her best protecting him, but... Can we trust that Al really hasn't met anyone other than him and, like, Subaru? When we say, is there any other Isekai characters currently? I'm not talking about... In the past, like Flugel, Hoshin, right? I'm talking currently. Maybe not. But I, I'm, I'm just trying to like see if there's any inconsistencies or consistencies with the episodic memory loss that Al deems to have in the web novel and to see if that actually matters in the official story. Instead of calling her Beatrice, he calls her Bayako, Subaru's nickname for her, causing her to get frustrated saying only Subaru can call her that. Al says I know. He knows. All too he well. knows that too well. Yes, this information was in a chibi anime that most viewers don't consume. Yeah. This is why I think this is the worst decision of the season so far, and it was hoping against all odds that this reveal would just be in the main anime, because otherwise, a lot of things are about to make no fucking sense. If they completely don't acknowledge this in the canon episode. And that, who knows? Time will tell. I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that... This break time episode was a specific thing in order to improve, try to improve the ratings of break time, right? Of course, the official subs not being there sucks, but, you know, there's more people watching ReZero than just a global audience that doesn't understand Japanese. But uh, until, if they, you know, continue with the anime episodes just fully with this shit just being assumed to, for the audience to know because they should have watched break time, then that's a massive L. I have no idea why they made the decision they made, like making it so that Subaru still doesn't know the anime, when this break time takes place during episode 1. It's nonsensical no matter how you look at it. Hmm. Luckily though, you watch this video and well, despite being re-added in the break time, it's still cut information from the reveal, so let's get into the cut content section. With the Al reveal being shoved absurdly stupidly into break time, it still cuts information. First of all, it neglects to mention that Al served a lot of his time here in this world Valakia. as a gladiator in Valakia. Yeah. Specifically 
What? It neglects to mention that Al served a lot of his time here in this world as a gladiator in Valachia. No. 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 Not like that. No, it's Valachia. It's not Vola- No! Fuck that! Now, no one has actually gone out and said this is the way you pronounce it. I, when, when I see V-O-L-L-A-C-H-I-A, I don't think Volake. I'm thinking Vola. It sounds cooler too. Volakia sounds more military, fascism, dictatorship, might makes all kinds of sound. Volakia sounds like a pussy ass sissy liberal, bro. Volakia sounds cool and like more hardened and fits the themes of what a nation like that is supposed to be than Volakia. I'm gonna die on this hill. Specifically, the gladiator island of Geninhive, where people are forced to fight for their life. That's where I'm assuming he lost his arm. It also cut that he lost his arm shortly after being isekai when he didn't know what was going on, and that he wears his helmet because his face is blanketed with scars and burns from his time as a gladiator, and mm. presumably other times. In the original reveal, Priscilla is also there, so she gets to talk a bit more about their circumstances. She says that the world of ReZero is flat, allegedly, mm -hmm. and at the edge lies a great waterfall. What do you, what do you mean, allegedly? Are we supposed to believe that the flat world fact is actually a conspiracy? <laughs> Could you imagine that the great waterfall and the flat world nature is actually cap and we've just been taking it as a fact, but it's not true? And at the edge lies a great waterfall. Yeah. Where water just falls off. And yeah. people like Alan Subaru are said to be from beyond the great waterfall. Yeah, because they don't really know what... Like, if you're from beyond the great waterfall, that's pretty much like an other world there, right? Because there can't be anything beyond the great waterfall. You must have shown there. And then if you kind of like hear about the term of like beyond the great waterfall, we also know that Sekhmet drove the divine dragon, you know, uh, beyond the great waterfall, right? The, what, did Volcanica also get fucking Isekai to a different world? Is Volcanica just at the bottom of the Great Waterfall? Sekhmet was also supposed to fall down and die because she fell down the Great Waterfall from fall damage? I don't know. Of course, many people who claim this are liars, but Al and Subaru are different. Subaru also asks Al if he has tried to find out why he was summoned or how to get home, and tells him no. He hasn't really had the time to, and he's had his hands full just trying to survive. Yeah. If you have the time, I really recommend reading the original novel review or even going to the Arc 3 manga to read it. Yeah, there's a video on YouTube and in my playlist too where we cut the, uh, we cover the, uh, the manga stuff, I think in Arc 3, Royal Selection stuff, right? Where Priscilla, Al, Subaru are in a carriage and they're talking about this shit. The anime has completely dropped the ball on this. There is something that was unfortunately cut. Uh, during the Capella versus Subaru thing, Kurush's condition getting worse and worse, and Capella openly mocks Subaru's mindset of wanting to save a girl because she's in trouble, another Arc 5 jab at the way Subaru acted in the past. Finally, the name of Capella's authority from Subaru is cut. Sadly, it's known as Transmutation and Transfiguration. Mui Tempen. Straight up just Mahito from Jujutsu Kaisen. Not a huge cut, just weird. And that will be it for episode 5. This episode was really good, with some great action shots, some incredible character acting from Capella, absolutely nailing her atmosphere, and a setup for a much larger thing to come, as Pristella is slowly turning into a lake. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, thank you, Mr. Asaratha, for the cut content stuff. Please go check out Mr. Asaratha's channel. Give it a like. Here is the link. And I will see you guys next time.